Neopor or Neopor, whatever that case was. Neoponset? Yes. Yes. Uh, you have the rule. Neoponset, Neoponset, I'm sorry. Uh, the court ruled that anything potentially all. Uh, the, the rule for touching the land. Touch and concern, right. Uh, give me a second. Let me just get the exact wording for you. I have my notes here. The exact language is <coughs> substantially alter rights. Right? Um, they also say it affects the legal relationship with the parties. Um, just so everyone knows, the question that, uh, that uh, Justin's asking... Justin, right? Yes. The question that Justin's asking us uh, was the test from the Ponset. And you recall that there were three requirements, historically, to enforce an equitable servitude. Um, there were three general requirements. Uh, the first was it had to have, um, one second, let me just make sure. Uh, it had to have, um, buh -buh. Right, intent to bind successors. Sorry, I have to put my notes from yesterday to make sure I get the right wording. Intent to bind the successors, um, that is, the people who created this equitable servitude want to bind not just themselves, but those who came after. Um, the second requirement is that the uh, covenant, or the quasi-covenant, you want to call it, uh, touched and concerned the land. Um, historically, that meant it had some sort of impact on how the land was used, but the Naponza case expanded it, and that was Justin's question, to basically mean, any restriction of the land that substantially alters the rights or substantially affects the land, which, to be frank, means just about anything in the world. Um, the most important point about the equitable servitudes is you don't have to deal with co uh, coveti uh, privity. That's with the horizontal and the vertical privity. It's all done as a matter of equity. Um, and what that actually means as a practical matter is that so long as the owner of the burden property has notice, they're bound by the equitable servitude. And it doesn't need to be actual notice. You can have what's called constructive or inquiry notice. Uh, for example, if you're in a community, a subdivision, and all the property is residential, and then you decide to put up a, con uh, sorry, a gas station, you should be on notice that you can't do that. OK. Does that help your question, Justin? Yes. OK. Other questions? All right, um, so the question was about terminology, right? Yeah. Does the word privy of contract, privy of estate, horizontal privity all mean the same thing? So let me answer your question two different ways. At one level, yes, right? Privity refers to a relationship, but there are different kinds of relationships. So for example, the horizontal privity means a relationship in which you create a covenant through the sale of property. Vertical privity means a relationship in which you take someone's entire estate. Those are related, but they're not the same thing. So unfortunately, Angie, my answer is you have to use the precise term, right? If I say horizontal privity, I'm talking about a sale of land with a covenant attached to it. Talking about vertical privity, I'm talking about uh, when two people buy, an one person buys the entire estate of another. And that's how I'm using the language. Uh, if you go back to our first week of class, we talk about tacking with adverse possession. If you and I are in privity, that means we're two squatters, and we have an agreement that I squat for five years, you squat for five years, and together we jointly acquire it. Remember the one stock rule that was from the um, the Lutheran case with the lake. Um, so similar phrases, but with different twists. Um, it just seems easier for me to understand when I that the contract. I yeah I just stick to whatever terms we use and y you you won't go wrong again th there is no statute <coughs> that defines horizontal privity that's not a statute the reason why we call it horizontal privity is that law professors have been drawing this stupid diagram of the board for hundred years and that's just what it's called and that's uh, we have a lot of things that are existence because of what law professors call them unfortunately and we're stuck with it yeah. Y 
yes, you, real covenant law refers to uh, actual covenants in writing, right? One of the definitions of, sorry, one of the requirements of real covenant law is the statute of frauds you have to have in writing. Uh, with equitable servitudes, this is in the Ponza case, Justin asked a minute ago, with the equitable servitudes, you don't need a writing. They had a writing in that case, but wasn't required. Tolk versus Moxie, the English case with the, the, the park and the square, right? There was no requirement of a writing there. I want to review also yesterday's class, or not yesterday, but two days ago's class, because I had to move a little quickly at the end, but I think it'll be useful. Uh, I'll get to the, the poll in a few minutes. Um, let's take another look at our favorite, or maybe a bit different adjective, but our well-worn diagram. Um, let me walk through it one more time. I think it's useful for today's class as well. Um, with easements, um, you don't have difficulty. When you create an easement, the easement will automatically bind anyone who comes onto the servient estate. We say that easements run with the land. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you acquired it. It doesn't matter how uh, uh, it was created. If an easement was properly established, it runs with the land. Now, you have the requirement that when you create an easement, you have to have privity of estate. This was Angie's question a minute ago, right? In the context of easements, privity of estate means you sell the land with the easement created. This was, a Luther, this was a, the Church of Christ case, okay? So in that regard, easements are easier. They run with the land. With covenants, it's tougher. It's tougher for a covenant to go down because you have these two requirements. Right? So we have A and we have B. A owns White Acre, and initially he owns Black Acre. If A just sells a covenant to B without any sale of land, they have a contract between them. And that contract is effective between the two of them. If for whatever reason B breaches that contract, A can sue. But merely selling a covenant by itself does not allow the covenant to go down. In order for the covenant to go down, two things have to happen. First, you need horizontal privity. A owns, let's say, a white acre and black acre, sells black acre to B, and reserves a covenant. Let's just say a residential purposes only. Right? A sells black acre to B, reserves a covenant, residential purposes only. By reserving the covenant, they've created horizontal privity on that sale. And this can take two forms. Let's say A goes ahead and sells White Acre to D. D can sue B precisely because horizontal privity exists. Let's say A gives D a leasehold. He's a tenant. D can still sue B. There's no requirement that the entire estate must be purchased for the benefit to run. The other side's trickier. In order for the burden to go from B to C, right? For the burden to go from B to C, you need what's called vertical privity. Ignore this phrase here, cross that in your notes, please. But you need vertical privity over here. And in this context, vertical privity means that you take the entire estate that B has. So if B has a fee simple, C must get a fee simple. If B has a life estate, C gets a life estate. Whatever, whatever, that, whatever that interest B has, C acquires a full bundle of sticks. And if you think about it this way, it makes sense. If B still has some sort of superior interest, maybe like a remainder or something else, right? He's a real person that should be sued, not the temporary tenant. You want the burden to be with the person who's there the longest, not the temporary tenant. Okay? So if A sells Black Acre to B and reserves a covenant, and B sells Black Acre to C, and they take the full fee simple, C is now in the same position as B, right? C stands in the same position as B, and C can be sued by A, or by D. You won't get that much. Now, I want to introduce another wrinkle. Here, there's only one covenant where A is dominant and B is servient. 
In most subdivisions, you have what are called mutually restrictive covenants. And that's the, the first case, say the Shelley case. It's a mutually restrictive covenant. That is, every house is both dominant and servient. That is, every house says, I will not do X, and you won't do X either. Right? Everyone see where I'm going with this is this is the Shelley case. We'll do it with a little bit in a little bit. Most covenants are not a one-way street. Most covenants are two-way. So let's say you have a subdivision. Every house has to be residential only, one family. They can't build commercial. Okay? That means my property is restricted. I can't build a factory in my land. But it also means I am benefiting because my neighbor can't build a factory in his land. We are mutually restricting each other's property. Okay? We are mutually restricting each other's property. Everyone with me? So how does that actually work in practice? Well, let's say you have a subdivision, right? You have a huge lot, and you want to sell it to 100 owners. And I am the original grantor. So what do I do? I chop it up. I chop up into 100 separate lots, and each lot sold has the covenant placed on it. So I am creating horizontal privity for 100 people. Do you see? Just it, I won't even try and draw it because it's going to be a freaking mess, right? This is simple because it's A and B. But imagine it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way, right? 100 people. Everyone is given privity of estate because you're creating the covenant as you sell the plot of land. And the covenant says, you will not build commercial, only residential. So that way, if one neighbor on the block decides to build a factory, any or all the other neighbors can sue them because they are all the beneficiaries of those covenants. Everyone with me, right? When you have these subdivisions, any neighbor can sue because they are all dominant and they can sue the serving tenement in that, in that context. That's precisely how the Shelley case came about. Right? We'll get to the constitutional issues in a few minutes, but at the most basic level, if you do it right, Every single house is bound by a covenant, and they're all created with horizontal privity in mind, such that there will be binding. And if one of those 100 people sells in fee simple to someone else, that person's now bound. So you have both horizontal and vertical privity. That's why these subdivisions are so significant. They create these restrictions that last indefinitely. What's that, Angie? I promise. Right? They create these restrictions that last indefinitely because you chop it up and you create the covenant right away, it's there. The Naponza case, though, is trickier because they didn't have the same kind of writing on every <coughs> plot of land, which is why the court has relied on this equitable servitude doctrine. Had they had horizontal and vertical privity, it would have been a lot easier, but they didn't have that present. Yes, Angie? Yes. They run both ways. So again, I'll just use this diagram because it's you know familiar with it. But in this diagram, A will be both dominant and servient, and B will be both dominant and servient. Understand? Second, let me let me check. I want to. I should this before I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, I think. Uh, can't find it now. All right, I'll, I'll look up later. But um, when you're drawing these diagrams for the exam or otherwise, you can start with this nice little four-point thing. But if I have like six people, it's going to get hard, right? I mean, you can try and draw it, but it just gets really messy. So you have to more or less visualize in your head the different transactions and sequence them. Okay, I have one of my older exams with um, a similar thing, and I was going to look for it now, but I, I I can't find. It'll take too much time. But as you're preparing for the for the final, if you want to go over with me, you're welcome to to chat. But I think that'll be a useful thing to think about because the mutually restricted covenants are most common. It's going to be rare that the arrow goes only one way. Usually, the arrows are going both ways at the same time.
Okay. Questions on that? Okay. All right. Oh yeah, yeah. Mike, go ahead, please. All right, it's a good question. Let me answer it this way. Um, <coughs> I will tell you if we're dealing with a covenant or an easement, okay? I don't have to. And some professors don't. And some professors will just give you facts and make you figure out which is which. I've thought about doing that and I decided against it. And I'll tell you the reason why. Almost anything you can do with an easement, you can also do with a covenant. And almost anything you can do with a covenant, you can also do with an easement. So it makes grading a mess. Because I can have a question within my covenant, and you give me an entire easement analysis, and you skip the entire thing, and it makes it hard to grade. So I will tell you. I don't have to, but I will tell you. But, but let me tell you something. You don't listen, right? I'll call something a covenant, and people will give me an easement analysis. And I'll call something an easement, and the students will give me a covenant analysis. No mercy for that, right? Because I'm giving you the name of the damn thing, so apply the right analysis. But I, maybe. Eight or nine of you will do it, like just, just my, my, my rough math. It happens every year. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. I, I want zero of you to do it. I'll be very happy. But it's, people do it consistently every year. There will be a question on easements, and then we talk about touch and concern of the land. They'll cite, you know, in the ponds it. <coughs> it happens. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, uh, Jessica. I, I guess maybe, maybe I'm mis I, mean, I know that I'm very similar to do the same stuff, but it seems like every time we talk about a covenant, it's been a restrictive you can have you can have restrictive uh, uh, easements as well. Okay. You can do positive or negative covenants or positive or negative easements. You can do both. Okay. Right. Y you can do it either way. Th but yeah, but I, I there are some professors I know who will not tell you what it is, to make you figure it out. You, that works, but it makes grading a little bit more messy because I'm not. You have basically two right answers, are completely different. Um, so I don't do that, but but I could. But I, but I won't. I think about these things actually a lot, so it's not like I'm just randomly answering Mike. Like I, I thought about this issue years ago. Justin, say hand. Well, I just kind of like, what, what do you look to to determine the difference? <sighs> or are there just two? So the th what Jessica said is probably right. Generally, an easement is positive and a covenant's negative. Generally, right? An easement is I can cross over Blackacre, mm -hmm. whereas a covenant is I will not build a factory. But you can have a negative easement. I will not pollute, right? I will not create smoke. You can have a positive covenant. I will, um, I I I will preserve this park, right? And let other people come onto it, right? As a covenant, you, you can do it either way. It's more common the way Jessica said it, but but there's nothing prohibiting positive and negative for both. Okay, which is why I don't test it because I think it's almost unfair to to guess because you can. There are always exceptions. But, uh, but Mike, let me put it this way. I may not say they create a covenant. I may say they covenant to do X. And that sometimes trips people off. Like I use covenant as a verb instead of a noun. All right, they covenant to restrict the land. I've done that before. And then you have to just remember I'm using the word covenant as a verb and not a noun, but it's the same thing. So I, I, that's not really tricking people, but I, I've done that before. Questions? All right. All right. Let's move on then. Let's go to today's material. Uh, where am I? Okay. Let's do a poll question. Um, you've taken con law, right? Yeah, it's going to be trickier going forward because some of my property students will have not finished con law yet. Um, historically, they, it's been offered sequentially, but now con law is going to be a third semester class. What's that? Yeah, I'm, I'm mixed on that. I think I think con law is good with maturity, but also it's hard to teach two L's. It's true. Uh, one L's are much more diligent with work than two L's. It's just that, that's just the way things go. All right, so that's true. A two L. Time to get to. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to. I don't need to, I don't need to outline anymore. I I know. All right. So the question is, and this will be a, f a review of what you learned in con law. The Constitution only regulates state action. True or false? Use your phone, please. Mm -hmm. 
I got 31 people in. Okay. Um, all right, so let me let's let's see how we did. See if you guys remember your comma. law. Um, still no. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Close enough. Okay, so that ninety percent of you said false, which which I think is the right answer. Um, was that? <laughs> There's an exception which I'll mention in a minute. Okay. Uh, it's actually a complicated, that, that's the best answer of the two. Let me explain why. Um, as a, <laughs> I'm so angry. As a, as a general matter, um, the U.S. Constitution limits government power, not individual power. Um, think of all the amendments, right? Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, right? The right to bear arms shall not be infringed. The people can't be searched unreasonably. These are all restrictions on government power. Um, indeed, it's a misnomer that we have a Bill of Rights. It's, I don't even like that name because it doesn't confer rights. It says the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Whatever that right is, it predated government. Uh, the freedom of speech shall not be abridged. It doesn't give you the freedom of speech. It says that right can't be abridged. That right predated government as well. So in many regards, our Constitution is a limit on government power. There's one. One exception, another one which I'm not going to mention, there's at least one exception, which is actually slavery. Um, the 13th Amendment says slavery shall not exist in the United States. Shall not exist. That means private and public, right? The government can't have slaves and people can't have slaves. So the answer to this one is yes, except the 13th Amendment. I'm sorry, it's no, but the 13th Amendment, right? Everything is else is there. There's also a, a slight example that's almost obscure about prohibition, right? States are actually allowed to prohibit alcohol under the 21st Amendment. They can still prohibit alcohol. That's why we have dry counties. In theory, if a person violates a prohibition law, they're actually violating the 21st Amendment. So if a private person bootlegs in a, in a dry state, that's technically a violation of the 21st Amendment. This never comes up. So the answer is, I think, false. But there is one fairly significant exception, which doesn't ever come up because Thank God slavery doesn't exist anymore. It, it, there are cases of human trafficking, but they don't exist as 13th Amendment cases or statutes. So it's basically the 13th Amendment and prohibition. So it's very obscure things. Okay. But as a general matter, the government is bound by the, uh, by, I'm sorry, is bound by the Constitution. Private people are not. So then that creates a question of segregation, right? When you have governmental segregation, People can bring claims under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, right? You see Brown versus Board of Education and these various other cases. When the government's doing the segregating, you can sue based on the 14th Amendment. What about private segregation, right? When a private business has a racial segregation policy. Or when homeowners, for example, create covenants. There the analysis is trickier. And there's some history that I'll just I'll backfill. Um, did you study the civil rights cases? That sound familiar? Okay. After the Civil War, Congress enacted a series of civil rights acts. These were federal laws based on the 13th and 14th Amendment. Um, today we think of the courts as the primary means of protecting civil rights, but that wasn't the original design. Originally it was Congress that was going to be protecting civil rights, and it would pass these various laws. And one of the laws that was enacted was the Civil Rights Act of 1870. This law in 1870, very long time ago, said that in places of public accommodation, racial segregation was illegal. I'm talking about theaters, hotels, um, uh, uh, public conveyances like a railroad or, or a ship, right? What you might call a common carrier under a common law. So places of public accommodation could not be segregated. Indeed, if the owner of the business ran a segregation policy, his penalty wasn't just paying a fine. He'd be criminally indicted. He'd go to jail for having segregation. And the idea was the way to get people to integrate their facilities was to throw them in jail. And indeed, after this law was enacted, there were U.S. attorneys who prosecuted business owners, and not just in the South, in New York, in San Francisco, and elsewhere, 
that had segregated businesses. The business owners then challenged the constitutionality of the Civil Rights Act. They said Congress can't regulate private conduct. And a decision that I'm not particularly in agreement with, the court says, no, nope, that's fine. You can't do that, right? Uh, uh, the 14th Amendment only allows Congress to regulate state action. And that's the key phrase, state action, where the state's acting. If private businesses want to segregate, that's their prerogative. And maybe the states can deal with it, but Congress cannot. Um, there was a lone dissent in that case, Justice John Marshall Harlan, uh, an icon of mine. And he explained, he explained that the 13th and 14th Amendments should not be read so narrowly, that there are various forms of uh, uh, segregation that could be prohibited. I'll just give you a brief, uh, 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 one brief argument. The 13th Amendment, if your constitution's handy, you should. The 13th Amendment says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist. That means slavery is not the same thing as involuntary servitude. Right? We think today that slavery is <coughs> synonymous with involuntary servitude, but they're different concepts. Involuntary servitude meant the literal act of bondage, right? Chattel slavery, you might call it. I'm sorry, uh, involuntary servitude was just the, 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 the act of having a chattel and ownership. But slavery was a broader concept. It, it referred to like a political and economy system that involved subordination, involved uh, uh, treating people unequally. Um, Harlan says that the 13th Amendment lets you eradicate all forms of this form of inequality, including segregation of private businesses. And I think Harlan probably had a better argument on that front, uh, but he lost. So that was 1873, might be off by a couple of years. Congress would not again enact civil rights legislation uh, until the 1960s. And in 64, you get the Big Civil Rights Act, which prohibited segregation in places of public accommodation. But this time, Congress didn't really rely on the Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. They instead relied on the Commerce and Necessary and Proper Clauses. The argument was that these sorts of businesses cater to out-of-state customers. They use uh, a goods and food that traveled in interstate commerce. And therefore, Congress can uh, regulate these businesses and, and require them to uh, 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 seat everyone without, without regard to their race, okay? But that was 1964, right? That was some time later. So almost 100 years, a century, really, 100 years, can you imagine, lapsed between the civil rights cases in 1870-something and the, civil rights, and, and the um, civil rights Act of 64. So we're talking a century lapses. The case we have today falls somewhere in the middle, right? 1948. 1948 was before Brown was decided. Brown was 53, or it's 55. My, not my column, but, but a couple years before Brown, several years before Brown. Okay? And at this point, when Shelley v. Kramer was decided, you still had the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, the separate but equal decision. So this case was decided in like a transitional period when things were moving towards Brown, but you weren't quite there. You're still a couple years away from it. Okay? That one, that's a crash course. I can give you more if you want, but it's a crash course. Yeah? Go right ahead. Go, more? Okay, I'll give you more. So the vote in Shelley was six to zero. Why was it six to zero? Aren't there nine justices? Well, three of them had, they believed that they, well, not that they believed, they actually had covenants in their own neighborhoods. Exactly right. There were three judges in the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, but you read. Good, thank you. But he's right. People don't always read the notes, but that's, he's exactly right. Three of the members of the court. By the way, do you know why that's in the book? Because I told the author. You're welcome. That was not in the last edition. Um, um, you know what? That's why I feel like I'm telling you something exciting, because they didn't know this before. Now it's in this edition. Justice Stevens, who clerked on the court in 1948, put this in his biography. This is what was a theory. People had theorized this for a long time, that three justices recused because they had racial covenants in their houses. But Justice Stevens confirmed in his biography, because he clerked to the court in 48. Stevens died a couple months ago, so he was a... Uh, Oh, God, he was 98 years old. He was quite old. So he had, like, clerked in the court in the 40s and served till 2010 or 11 or so. Yeah. So anyway, but 
Yes, you know that because in the book, because I put it there. But anyway, but it's, it's absolutely correct. So even in D.C., uh, this issue actually is even more recent. When Justice Rehnquist was having his confirmation hearing to be Chief Justice in 86, it turned out that he had a vacation home. I think it was in Delaware, but check me on that. I think it was in Delaware that had a racial covenant on it. And this became a huge issue. No, it was in Delaware. I forget where it was, but I know Rehnquist had it. And then one of the senators who was going after him, I think it was Biden. It may have been someone for, it was, was it Biden? Then so Biden turns out had one also on one of his problems. Yeah. Nothing changed. The same people just keep repeating it in time. I think Biden had one also in his home. Like he didn't realize it as well. I suspect that if you guys did title searches in your houses, you'd find it. Yeah? Well, it might be a recent build, but the land might not be. Because because the the covenant, I mean, unless you, you were in an empty lot, but covenants were put on land, not on houses. Right? I'll give you one more, and I'll, I'll move on, because he asked for They're still there. Yeah, not enforceable, but they're still there. Let me give you one more, because you asked me at Houston. Um, did anyone see the movie Green Book? Okay, so Green, uh, Green Book was a movie came about a year ago, right? Uh, the premise of this movie was you had, um, it was a musician, right? Right, it was a musician who was traveling uh, to southern states, and he basically had a white driver. He was an African-American musician with a white driver, basically to protect him. And at the time, there were a significant number of businesses that just would not cater to black customers. So a book was published called The Green Book. And that basically listed all the businesses in the state that would cater to African-American customers. You can find the Houston version, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's got, the, got the Library of Congress website. And I actually pulled it up. And I don't know if any of the businesses are still in effect, but they have a couple pages. It's not very long. Of the business in Houston that would actually cater to African-American customers. I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, I knew Rocky would have it. No, it, it's, like a, it's like a national book. Yeah. But they have a couple pages for Texas, which I just, I just skimmed through. And, you know, it's like restaurants, hotels, uh, you know, barbershops, right? Uh, gas stations, um, you know, places to get your car fixed, a mechanic, right? Just like basic things. So... There's a lot of history in this time, and you know I could teach a comma class on it, but this is property. I'll do my best. Um, anything else you want to ask? I usually try to make this a. But this will become comma the last couple of weeks when we do takings. Unfortunately, um, it's all Supreme Court stuff, which I hate teaching in this class. I love property because they're, lo they're rules. Then we get to takings, and it's Justice Kennedy. Yeah. So this one was 50 years, but the other ones are they like indefinite? Are they just? Well, covenants. You can't really say a covenant lasts forever, right? Um, don't make me mention the rule against perpetuities. <laughs> but, 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 but generally, you can't have interests that are indefinite. There are some exceptions. So for example, you have a term of years, like lease. You have a thousand-year lease, which for a reason those are But I don't know that a covenant we actually say lasts forever would be valid. I, I, I think it's sort of just understood that at some point they're, they, they fall into destitute, they fall, they're no longer enforced. Anything else? Yeah, my, my. Like, for example, like on racial covenants, that kind of thing. Why can't they just get rid of how do you re how do you, how do you release a covenant, Mike? What do you have to do? That's, I mean, that's the second case. That's the, that's, yeah, that's the second case, the, the, the Truskolowski case. I was going to answer it. You can answer it. I'll sue it now. Yeah, sure. <coughs> like, how do you, it's at the very end, termination of covenants. How do you get rid of a covenant? Nine. 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 Uh, yeah. Acquiescence, yep. Unclean hands. Latches, yeah, exactly. Good. All right, yeah, so let me answer Mike's question. Generally, the only way to get rid of a covenant 
is if there's a release. Now, if it's just two neighbors, right, on a block, yeah, you get your release. But what if you have a subdivision with 50 properties? You need a release from each and every neighbor. And if one neighbor holds out, the covenant remains in effect because there's still a, a, a dominant tenement and you're still servient, right? You're servient from every single one. So that's why it's hard. Now, they have this business of changed circumstances, which maybe would be useful. Let's actually do the facts of the property uh, of Shelley case. I think actually I can show you that this covenant was not valid on its face. Forget the Constitution for a minute. Right, who, who's next? Oh, that's right. You were, you were, you were next, right? Right. All right. You want to give me the facts in Shelley, please? Right. So Shelley was looking by a property in St. Louis. However, she was unaware that there was a covenant saying that no African Americans could move there for the next 50 years. Yep. Uh, after she tried to move in. It wasn't just African Americans. I just want to. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that, that meant Asian people, right? So this wasn't just for black people, it meant for Asian people as well. The, the, the phrase he was among, like, I, I don't know why in, that's the word they used, but that's the word they used. What was that? <laughs> All right, go on. Go on, Michael. So about, I think, 30 up to 39 people who lived there kind of signed a petition about it. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, by the way, this is what the Shelley house looks like. A friend of mine lived in St. Louis and took some pictures. Um, it's hard to see, but it, uh, there's a picture. If you zoom in, I know it's really hard to see, but there's a little plaque on the front, and it says the Shelley house from Shelley v. Kramer. Um, and this is the Shelley family. Yeah. All right. What was that? Yeah, I mean, there they go. Are there any other pictures? And this is a letter uh, that the Shelley family sent to Thurgood Marshall, who was one of the attorneys for the NAACP. Um, I'll, I'll put the link to this on the class notes. I, I, I blogged this some years ago, so you can, you can read it at your, own, uh, at your own time. Okay. Are there any other pictures I want to show you? Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. But yeah, you can click, and click through those at your own time. Um, so at the first step, Avery, you have this agreement that was signed. There were 57 lots on this avenue. There were 30 owners who held 47 of them. Five were actually owned by African American families at the time. And then at least seven of the nine on the south side didn't sign the covenant. Is this a valid covenant? Why not? What's missing? And just like forget Constitution for a minute. Just why is this not a valid covenant for, for just pure property law? Forget forget common law for a minute. What's what's missing? What are the requirements to establish real covenant law? What are the three requirements for a covenant law? Give me one of them. What's the big one, the important one we spent all this time fighting about? Privity. privity. What are the two kinds of privity? Uh, contract no. Ooh. no. <laughs> that was your question, right? <laughs> what are the, for, for this class, at least, what are the two kinds of privity? Horizontal See, she's giving, it's like air traffic control, <laughs> right? Horizontal and vertical privity. Avery, was there even remotely horizontal <laughs> that's okay. It's late. I don't have peripheral vision that way. That so they can get away with stuff. Avery, was there even remotely horizontal or vertical privity here? No, there wasn't. Remember, I said the subdivision. Each and every house must be carved out and sold with the covenant on it. At common law, you can't just slap a covenant on a piece of land. That doesn't work. You can't do that. I think this entire thing was invalid on property law. That was my exam a couple years ago. I basically said, forget the Constitution. Do Shelley as a matter of property law. I think this was invalid. Now, this wasn't a valid covenant, Xavier. So my follow-up question is, could it have been deemed an equitable servitude? What are the
It's my friend from Equal Servitude. There are three. That's fine. You can check your notes. Okay, that's one. What's the second one for Neponset? Justin asked me about this a minute ago. Can anyone help him out? Yeah. Touch concern, that's right. And what's the last one, the, the big, the important one? Notice. Notice. All right, so my friend, is there an equitable servitude? Could there be an equitable servitude in this case? No, no, I don't believe it has notice. Why? In other words, would the people in this neighborhood have been on notice that you had this racial restriction in there? No, because they, they would, wouldn't have told you. But there's another thing, who was living there at the time? There it is. Yeah. At the time, there were five African American families in the block. So I don't think you have either a covenant, because you don't have horizontal or vertical privity, and I don't think you have any equitable servitude, because you don't have the notice. Indeed, I don't think this touches and concerns the land. Even given the Ponset, how on earth does the racial composition of a household touch and concern the land? It's completely irrelevant. Right? It, 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 it's not historically what a covenant was. So I. I tend to think the entire uh, restrictive covenant is just an abuse of property law. Forget, forget the Constitution for a you know, we I'll never say it ever again, but just forget the Constitution for a minute. Actually, hell, Madison, right? Forget the Constitution for a minute, but this is just wrong as a matter of property law. Now, the Supreme Court didn't want to do that, right? Can you imagine the Supreme Court issues a ruling on horizontal privity? That wasn't going to happen. That was not going to be the holding from this case. They did it um, a different way. So the way the court actually analyzed it was not on what horizontal and vertical privity are, but instead they considered the state action requirement. The court acknowledged that only state action can be prohibited by the 14th Amendment. Here you had a private covenant. I'll put it in scare quotes, but you had, a, you had a private covenant. So Tom, help me out here, right? How does the court, I think it was Chief Justice Vinson, how does the court find that this private agreement, whatever you want to call it, is governed by the 14th Amendment? It's a denial of rights. Um, it's been recognized that the action of state courts in enforcing the state courts. Ah, say it louder. It has been recognized that the action of state courts in enforcing the substantive common law rules formulated by these court, those courts may result in a denial of rights yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, very good. What is the state action here? This is an agreement that has to be enforced by the courts. The courts have to enforce it. That is, if one of the neighbors goes to court, say, "No, no, no, the the family can't move in here," the court is engaging in state action. So. It's kind of a weird holding. What the court says is, you can have a restrictive racially covenant, a racially restrictive covenant, but you can't go to court to enforce it. So it's basically a worthless piece of paper, right? The second you try to bring the courts into this um, environment, you are participating in state action, and that is a violation of the 14th Amendment. So here the court says that racially restrictive covenants are unconstitutional. This is why some of you might have some in your deed history, right? They can exist as a matter of contract, right? It's not like they're expunged or just crossed out from your deed. They just can't be enforced, right? If you were to bring this to court, you'd be laughed out. Okay, so we get the holding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think this case came about because one of the neighbors sued to block them from moving in. Right? In other words, the standing was actually because the neighbor tried to rely on the deed to, to block this family from moving in. 
Right. It, it wasn't like, let me just give some background. These were often test cases. You know what that phrase means, a test case? They were set up. So you basically had a white family that knowingly wanted to sell a home to an African-American family to try and get this litigation going because they knew their neighbors would go bring, bring a lawsuit and sue them. They wanted this lawsuit. Uh, there was another case uh, from the 19, ugh, 1920s, I'm off by a year, called Buchanan versus Warley, right? Buchanan versus Warley, uh, W-A-R-L-E-Y. Um, the city of Louisville, Kentucky uh, enacted a law that was basically a racial segregation ordinance. It said if a block was predominantly white people, you couldn't sell the house to a black person. And if the, house was pr if the block was predominantly black, you couldn't sell to a white person. There was an exception for house help and servants. That was actually in the statute. So if you had a housekeeper or a nanny, that was fine, right? What that meant was if you had a white block, it stayed a white block. If you had an African-American block, it stayed an African-American block. That was the upshot. The Supreme Court considered a case in which a black homeowner tried to sell his house to a white person. See, that was a setup. They wanted a white plaintiff. So you had a white guy trying to buy the house in a black neighborhood. It was a total setup from the NAACP. That was their lawsuit. And the Supreme Court ruled that the, that the Louisville law was unconstitutional. Right? This was before Brown. The court said there's a right of contract, a liberty of contract, Lochner, right? A liberty of contract to sell and buy property, which is somewhat similar to what's going on here. Now, here's the rub. The opinion was unanimous, right? But Justice Holmes, who I'm not a fan of, <laughs> Justice Holmes wrote a dissent that no one joined. And what did Holmes say? I don't like the suit. It's a setup. Because the 14th Amendment wasn't meant to protect the white guy. And he was annoyed that they brought a white plaintiff from NAACP when they should have been helping the black, uh, black plaintiff. So Holmes wrote this dissent. I have it in my, in my, in my case book, uh, if you ever want to see it. It's, it's a draft. Uh, but no one joined him, so he withdrew it, and he won with the majority. I'm sorry, your hand was up a minute ago? Okay, you sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so any, um, oh, I think, isn't Buchanan Orley cited in this case? I think it's mentioned somewhere. It was a very important case. Um, very important, people forget, but it was an important case. It might actually be in the full case, but not the edited version in your book. No? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, the, I mean, the prop people, they would, they would edit that anyway. All right. Everyone good? All right. This decision, though important, didn't have a long shelf life. Um, why? But uh, 20 years later, in 1968, Congress enacts the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act. Um, this is a statute, not a constitutional provision. And the Fair Housing Act makes various forms of... Um, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 discrimination in housing illegal. That is, landlords who own more than a certain number of units uh, can't deny housing based on a race. Um, there are still exceptions. If you have a few, few empty rooms in your house, yes, you can exclude people based on race. Uh, it, it has limitations on advertising. You can't put in an advertisement saying whites only, right, or, 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 or you know, white women only. Or things, you know, th you'll see these ads from time to time. Um, so now if you have any housing discrimination, it's statutory in nature, it's not constitutional. So there really isn't um, uh, that much uh, uh, litigation based on the, um, the Shelley case. Uh, now people ask about private clubs, right? Uh, there are private clubs that have racial policies. Uh, there are certain golf courses and, and country clubs that maybe only exclude, that exclude women. Uh, for many years, Augusta National is one of them, but that, that changed some years ago. Um, you see this also in the context of roommates, right? Let's say you put an ad on Craigslist for a roommate, and you say, I'm looking for a man only or a woman only. Or if you say, I want a straight man or a straight woman only. If you say, I only want a white roommate or a black roommate. The rules for roommates are different because it's only one person, and you don't have the same kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, the same kind of restrictions you'd have for a bigger landlord. Um, so this issue comes up increasingly. Okay, if you ever take a class on employment discrimination, you, should, um, you all work. So you know what HR is. Um, HR has lawyers, and this is a, this is an area of law that always is lucrative. There's always <coughs> need for, for for discrimination lawyers because there's always these lawsuits going on. So if you can take a class in law school on, on, on civil rights law and discrimination law, just take it, have that in your back pocket. Uh, it's not in the bar, but you'll encounter it no matter what field you're in because every 
company has HR screw ups where you need to know this stuff. Every, every company does. You probably all know this. Uh, any company you're in will have these issues. So whoever your client is, this, pop, this issue pops up. Okay? All right. Questions on Shelly? Not the rule in Shelly's case. I taught that this morning. I taught that this morning, sorry. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I think, I think I've gotten better at teaching. It's hard, but I think I've gotten better. I've worked on it. Okay, anything else in Shelly? All right, let's move on. All right, so I think Tom already told us the termination of the covenant, but I'll, I'll discuss it again briefly. Um, the rules for covenant, I'm sorry, the rules for terminating a covenant are going to be very similar to the rules of terminating easement. And the book lists nine of them. Uh, the first one is what's called merger. That is, if the same person owns both the dominant and the servient estate, the covenant dissolves. So perhaps one way to kill it is to just buy the entire damn subdivision. Mike, to your question, right? How do you get rid of it? If you just buy out all of your neighbors, that will eliminate the covenants. Hard to do, because people don't always sell their land. The second one is what's called a release. And the term release you'll see in contracts, you'll see it in all different topics. A release is when a person signs a writing to give up their rights, right? I relinquish my right to sue you, right? I relinquish my right to uh, 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 file a lawsuit or to do something, right? Um, releases are very common. Uh, those are governed by the rules of contract. So if there's duress and the various other defenses, it may not be enforced. But if it's a valid release, it's enforceable. Um, the third one is called acquiescence, which is a weird word which you may, maybe don't see in other classes. Um, but acquiescence means you basically give in, you surrender. So if, a, uh, if the dominant tenement just fails to enforce a servitude for some time and then later decides, you know what, I'm going to sue, the court's going to actually say, no, no, you're too late. You can't do that. Right? The idea is if a person sits on his butt and doesn't enforce his rights, you've considered to acquiesce to it. Very similar to number six, by the way, latches. I'll come, I'll come to that again. Um, the fourth one is what's called abandonment. Abandonment. If there's a piece of property with a covenant on it and you abandon it, you just leave, pack up and go. After some time, if the land's empty, you make it unenforceable. Right, but that's a matter of the court doing it. It's a matter of equity. There's no bright line rule of how long you have to abandon it. It's sort of open-ended doctrine. Um, number five is what's called the unclean hands, uh, which sounds very dirty, right? But you, you've, you've heard of unclean hands in contracts? The idea is, let's say you have a subdivision that says residential only, and the owner of Blackacre builds a factory, and no one cares. And then the owner of Black Acre, I'm sorry, the owner of White Acre builds a factory, and then the owner of Black Acre sues the owner of White Acre. Right? You did the exact damn thing, right? If you built a factory, you can't see your neighbor from building a factory. You have unclean hands, you're not the right person, get out of court. Um, again, this is an equitable doctrine. It's not like written in a statute or anything. Uh, the sixth one's called latches. It's spelled L-A-C-H-E-S. So it's not laches, it's latches. Um, latches is similar to a statute of limitation. That is, if you wait too long to enforce your suit, to bring a suit, the court won't enforce it. Now, what's the difference between a statute of limitation and, and latches? A statute of limitation is a statute. The state says five years, ten years, a fixed number. Usually, latches kicks in if you're not yet at the statute of limitations, right? So let's say the statute of limitations is five years but you decide to bring the suit 10 years later. Ah, the court says, but you know, there's some fairness, right? You know, you waited too long, you should have brought it earlier, you're done. Okay, what if the statute of limitations is 10 years and you brought the suit at year five? The court can say, you know what? You're not barred by the statute of limitations, but you should have brought the sooner. You waited five years, so I'm not going to enforce it. Latches kicks in when you're not at the statute of limitations yet, but you still waited a long time. So technically it's fine, but the court says you, you, you waited too long. We're not going to enforce it. Mike? Isn't that very similar? It's almost, it's very similar. I think I said before, four and six are real similar. 
I'm sorry, three and six are real similar. Right? Because generally, if you wait too long, that means you gave in. Um, equitable doctrines are often um, overlapping, and they address similar concepts. Okay. Uh, number seven is what's called estoppel. This is estoppel everywhere, estoppel, right? You can have this phrase over and over again in law school. Um, if the defendant relied on the plaintiff's conduct, it might be inequitable to allow the plaintiff to enforce the covenant. So let's say, you know, the owner of Blackacre says, I want to build a factory. And he asks his neighbor, says, hey, would you mind if you built a factory? He's like, nah, go ahead, you can do it. And he invests all this money and builds a factory, and the neighbor comes around and sues him. There might be a situation where based on estoppel, the court bars enforcement of the, of the covenant. Maybe. Okay. Number eight is eminent domain. Um, eminent domain is the power of the state to seize your land. Um, when the state uses eminent domain, it clears out all covenants, right? So it's not like the government takes the land subject to your covenant. The covenant gets wiped out. Okay. The last one is what's called change circumstances. And that's the subject of our second case today, Western Land versus Tr Truskolowski. Oh, that's my best bet. Okay. And there are some cases where the situation's changed. And perhaps a covenant that made sense many years ago doesn't make sense anymore. And at that point, you go to the court to try to enforce it. I'm sorry, you, get, you go to the court to try and say, let's modify the covenant. Now, let me make just a point here at the outset. Oftentimes, covenants are not very important. The city has a zoning code, right? If the city zones a neighborhood for one family residential, it doesn't really matter what the covenant says, right? If the covenant says no factories, but the city zoning authority is one, uh, one family residential, the covenant's irrelevant. You can't build a factory there. You can get the city to change the zoning code, right? There's a board to do that. There's a process to change the zoning code, but there's no process to change a covenant. The only way to change a covenant is to go to court and try and get the court to reform or modify the covenant. And that's what's going on in this case, where simultaneously the, the, the parties are trying to change both the uh, 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 zoning code for the city and to modify the covenant. Yes, Catherine? Did you say that if there's an existing covenant that it conflicts with the city zoning code? Yeah. Right. In other words, let's say you have a um, covenant that says residential only. And the city then zones the land and says, uh, I'm sorry, let's well, say so you have a covenant that says commercial only, right? You can only do commercial. And the city zones as residential only. You're, you're stuck with residential, right? If there's a conflict, you can't go to court and say, aha, I have this covenant that, via, that, Trump state, that Trump state law, that's not gonna work. But good question, very good question. All right, uh, are you next? Yeah, you want to give me the facts, please, in the Truskolaski case? Oh, I can skip you if you want. It's actually not. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I, when your voice is going, the worst thing to do is talk. And even it's worth to whisper. Um, I actually, I remember when I had, I was a 3 I had my wisdom teeth pulled and I had like laryngitis after it. And it killed me because I couldn't talk. So I was like typing on my Blackberry and showing people. That was the only way I could like communicate. Uh, it, was, it was a very hard week of school for me. I was not happy, but I appreciate that you slogged through that. Okay. So here are the facts. The Truskolaskis uh, are homeowners in Reno, Nevada. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Back in the 40s, there was a subdivision and it was subject to a restrictive covenant. Single family dwelling, no commercial, no stores. Um, at the time, most of the land was used for residential and agricultural, but there wasn't much commercial. Uh, 30 years later, the neighborhood starts to change and the character changed. Um, Western wanted to build a shopping center within the land. 
Um, the lower court held that the covenant's enforceable, and they blocked construction of the shopping mall. And the shopping mall said, but the neighborhoods change over the years. We need to nullify the covenant and reform it in light of the changed circumstances. Okay, so Celeste, does the court, is the court willing to reform and modify the covenant here? No, tell me why, please. Okay. So the key point here is that the court is not willing to nullify the covenant. They say the covenant did not outlive its usefulness. And even if... Siri? <laughs> Lisa? I don't know why she picked that. What did I say? I have no idea. I don't know. Did I say Siri or something even close? She never comes on for me, but like my husband all the time. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, or was that? Yeah. So the, the, uh, even if a shopping mall is more valuable than residential, the, the covenant can still be enforced. And the court says basically, look, if you really want this, negotiate. Show me the money. Pay me for it. Right? So Desiree, what actually happens after the case finishes? What what, 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 what what does Western actually do when everything winds up? Oh, they agreed to um, three and a half acres. Yeah. And, and what did they do for it? They, uh, it's not in the case, but what do you think they did? But what, what, did, the, what did the neighbors get? Oh, they got paid. Yeah. In other words, if this is really important to you, if this is really important to you, pay the neighbors. Now, what they could also do, what they could also do, is petition the city to rezone the land, right? But this is now the flip side of Catherine's question. Even if the city rezones the land, the covenant's still in effect, right? So even if the city agrees to zone, you're still bound by the covenant. You need a release from the neighbors, and to do that, you got to pay them. Yeah, Tom. I have a question for Kate. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay. Is this similar to the actual high-rise litigation or issues that are currently going on I have a follow-up question. I'm sorry. Um, w in what way? <laughs> Here, let me let me come closer so you have to yell. Yeah. Yeah. If all the homeowners in Ashby said, "Screw, we don't care anymore," then they can build it. But that's not going to happen here, right? Because think about it this way, right? You're the neighbors, right? Let's say there are five neighbors. And let's say neighbor number one gives a release for $1,000. And then neighbor two gives a release for $2,000. And neighbor three gives a release for $3,000. And neighbor four for $4,000. They need neighbor five to close the deal, right? What's neighbor five going to charge? $20, Whatever he wants. Because that's what's called the holdout problem. Because the last person who holds out gets the most. So you saw the movie Aaron Brockovich some years ago, yeah. right? And they want to try and buy out all the neighbors very quietly, yeah. one at a time, to, I think there was some pollution thing. I can't remember the, the, the facts of the movie, right? But the last neighbor who holds out, that's when they go after the hardest, because they, unless they get everyone to release, the covenant's still in effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Catherine? You said if the city says you can build commercial here, and then the covenant says, no, you can only build residential, you enforce the more stringent one, huh. right? If the city says, yeah, you can build whatever. Look, Houston, I'll give you Houston's example, right? Houston has no zoning code. The only way people can restrict land usage in Houston is through covenants, and we have a lot of them, right? So in, you know, where I live, on my block, I can build a factory next door, but for the fact that there's a covenant present. The covenant says you can't. Covenant says only one family residential. Yeah, Melanie. I guess it's confused because I have a job and the covenant says commercial only. The city zoning residential. You enforce the more stringent one. What's more stringent? Generally, residential is more stringent, right? In other words, if this, we'll do zoning in about two or three weeks, but I'll, but I'll only just give you a preview. There's a pyramid, right, of preferred uses. At the very top of the pyramid is one family housing. 
Below that's two family housing. Below that's three family housing, then apartment, then industrial, and then basically just like whatever, right? It's stacked up. So you take whatever the highest rung on the ladder is. We'll, we'll do zoning, I think, four or five classes on it. You'll be, okay. we weren't supposed to hear that. <laughs> Excuse me. Zoning is you and your arms today, man. <laughs> Just around. Okay, fine. I'd be called a pig in class. Fine, I agree. I'm sorry. Uh, my mom will be mad at me. Yeah. She watched the video. <laughs> <laughs> she, she came to class. No, Not for a year? Oh, yeah. She, every semester. Came to my day class. Always. Oh, I was like. <laughs> too late. No, she was here for. It's, it's, it's too late for her. She's on a different time zone. I can't keep her here until 10 o'clock. Where's she come from? Where's she from? I'm from Staten Island, New York. No, she comes usually once or twice a semester. They both my dad and mom come. They always come to class. Once my mom was actually saying, all those kids were on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, I know, mom. I know. <laughs> I know. I, I know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. It's, it's cute. It's cute. She's a professor also. She knows the deal. OK. All right. Um, but does that make sense, Melanie? Just yeah. Usually the one family housing is like the top. And that's, what, that's the most stringent. That's what these people want to maintain for their, for their neighborhood. OK. All right. Questions? All right. Let me, yeah, Mike. I do like the fact that you give your mom's voice when you do your accent. I had a New York accent, and it comes out with some words I say. You're from Jersey, right? Yeah. You hear it sometimes, right? Oh, yeah. Like when you say water, water, you say water. The W, the A U H, right? A, A U G H, it, it comes out. I, I've beaten most of it, but, but it comes out. All right. Questions? And if not, I'll wrap up. All right. Uh, the topic today really fit in anywhere. Uh, the first case isn't really a property case, but I think it should be. And the second case discusses changed circumstances. What I really need you all to do carefully is understand this diagram and recognize that it's not limited to A, B, C, and D, right? You can have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And I want you to actually try to take some of the old exams and you'll see the way I ask about it. I, I can't tell you now, it'll take me an hour to explain it. But if you take the old exams, you'll see how complicated it is, and you'll get a feeling of what the mutually restrictive covenants look like. Any questions? No? All right, I'll thank you all. I'll see you guys next week. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Get them a little early today. <laughs>